in all of that. Hi, I'm Shivani. I'm Shivani. And welcome to New York's Millennial Mind. Where today you're gonna get a content masterclass on how to pitch to brands, create better content, and monetize on all your platforms because Shivani here is gonna tell you all the secrets. So if you can, please press the like, subscribe, and follow button. And of course, watch till the end to hear the best surprise. Shivani. Hello. Hello. Welcome to New York's Millennial Mind. Thank you. Thank you I'm for having me. So happy to be here with you and so happy to finally meet you. It doesn't feel like we're meeting for the first time. You're the first Shivani I've interviewed. So it's going to be. I'm honored. I'm honored. Really weird for me to keep saying your name. I say people's name a lot in the podcast, so it's going to be hard for me. But, you know, you are someone who I think is like the queen of content. I look at your content and I think it's like next level. It's so good. Every piece is so unique, the way you storytell everything. And I'm so excited to delve into your journey. Thank you so much. It means so much because I feel like when I share, I never really realize like who is watching it. And you're Mm. like, oh, they're just random people on the internet. And then people actually come up to you and they're like, I saw your video. You're like, really? You watch my stuff? I know. It's so weird, isn't it? Because you just think like, wait, sometimes you're just, it feels surreal that you feel like you're putting content out, right? I also like never let my parents or family watch my videos in front of me. I'm like, I do not want to hear me speak. Don't watch my videos in front of me. So I like living in this bubble that like just random people in this world are listening to my stuff, but are not actually there. No, I completely agree. Sometimes I get into a car and someone's listening to my podcast. I'm like, turn it off. (laughs) It's so uncomfortable. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, just turn it off. It makes me so uncomfortable to listen to my own voice. Yeah. But we're here to talk about you. Yes. I'm very excited. So you graduated school. Yes. What did you graduate? University of Michigan. I was rejected from the business school, which was like the backup. I started with biomedical engineering, had this entire pivot that happened, which we can get into. But then I graduated with a liberal arts degree in communications and a minor in entrepreneurship. And at the time, I felt like such a loser with like a communications degree because I was like, I should be in business or engineering. Um, But then it all ended up working out. So that's amazing, actually. I didn't even know you could do a communications degree. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if I would recommend the degree. I feel like it was kind of just like I needed to graduate with something. Right. And I felt like at the time, um, with what I wanted to do within like the creative industry, I was like, oh, communications would be a good degree. But if you asked me like three years before that, before I went to college, I was like ready to become a doctor. Like my entire first 18 years of my life I felt like I followed the Indian girl script to the T and then fully went like off script before college and then right before entering freshman year I was ready to like not even go to college I was telling my parents I want to like live in India so it's like a whole wait 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 thing before what sparked this change because conforming for a long time gets you into a mindset where you think you can't escape yeah so how did that switch happen So the summer before I entered my freshman year of college, I went to Mumbai to visit my Masi, my mom's sister's family, just as like a vacation. And instead of just being like, oh, this is the one summer, I don't have to do anything science-y related, right? Like I could have fun, it doesn't have to be good for the resume. I was very, very by the book, Shivani. And this summer I was like, you know what? I saw this Facebook post looking for an internship at Miss Malini. I don't know if you're familiar with the company. They do like... It's an entertainment portal for like Bollywood news and gossip and updates and that type of the stuff. Like a TMZ? Yeah, like a TMZ, I guess. Okay. Um, And I have always grown up like this massive Bollywood fan. So I was like, you know what? I should just apply. And I vividly remember I was sitting on my bed and I was like, I'm going to send my, you know, application. And I never heard back. And me just being like the what's there to lose all the different permutations and combinations of the founder, Malini Agarwal's email, I typed in like malini.agarwal, malini.a, malini underscore Agarwal until like one email went through because I knew the ending had to be at missmalini.com. And I was like, I want to intern for you. And so sure enough, she ended up responding. I did the same like stalkerish behavior for her (laughs) co-founder who was her husband being like, look at my, you know, application and whatever an 18 year old's resume I put together. And she was like, we had a few you know email exchanges after and she was like okay you can come into the office here's like a nominal whatever stipend 
But from my end, I was like, I'm here, you know, just on a vacation in Mumbai. Yeah. So any work experience would be fun. Like this would just open my eyes up to a brand new world. And that internship just changed like the entire course of like my tr- professional trajectory. I that summer was like, oh, if I'm, you know, going into this office, I should like try modeling. Like people have always been like, oh, Shani, you have like a pretty face. Like you should look into modeling. But people say that. No one actually tells you like, how do you actually become a model? So I would like Google like modeling auditions Mumbai. And after my internship, I would end around like 5, 6 p.m. I went to this area called Aram Nagar in India. Uh, sorry, in Mumbai. And I would just like cold walk in to these auditions. I'd like follow people that are like they look like models into like these random studios where they'd be giving auditions and they'd be like, Kisne tumko balaya? like who called you here? And I'd be I'd randomly like open up my WhatsApp and I'd be like, oh, Shalini called me. Shalini is my mom's name. Like there's no Shalini that actually has called me. And then they'd look and they'd be like, OK, fine, you can give an audition. But like I've never held a slate card. I've never practiced or learned how to model but I just had this mentality that summer of like what is there to lose and so one after the other like two weeks into this internship at Miss Malini I was at an event with Shah Rukh Khan and I like took this photo and I was like oh my god like this is my <laughs> wildest dreams like I'm interviewing these people and like at these press events and it just opened up my eyes to the fact that there is a world beyond this like conventional career and this conventional path and I just never knew that something like that like that existed and like looking at Malini and being like if this woman who you know well educated Nashad like was from Harvard and Yale and is building this company why am I not doing something more creative and more closely aligned to my passions and that's where I called up my parents and I was like I don't even want to go to college like I am staying in India and they were like, no, Shvani, like you are going to come back and you need to get a degree, which I'm glad I did. Hence the communications degree. <laughs> I felt like I was going to cry. I had shivers the whole time you were telling me that story. That is wild. Yeah, it was crazy. Have you always been a go-getter? I think so. I've always, I think, had a bit of a confidence even growing up. Yes. I think via dance, I grew up <laughs> dancing and like performing on stage And my mom was like a huge proponent of like street smarts and talking to people. And like growing up, I have this memory where we would like go to amusement parks and my mom would like get these like bulk tickets on Craigslist. I don't know if you're familiar with this platform. And she would tell me and my brother like, okay, well, we got these cheaper tickets. We have extra tickets. You need to sell them to like these other people who are standing in line to buy tickets, go up to them and sell these remaining tickets and then you guys are going to be able to go inside the amusement park or you know if food came you know at a restaurant she would always make us like talk to the waiter and be like you know we're vegetarian like this needs to get fixed or this so that confidence of just going up to people and asking for like what you want because what is the worst that they're gonna say is no I also feel like at 18, no one has any expectations of you. Like my parents, like when I told them I'm going to India, no one thought I was going to like do really anything, right? Like no one's looking at you. Yeah. Um, So I think that's kind of where the confidence came from. Do you always feel confident now? No, not at all. Because all of a sudden, right, you're out of this bubble of college and everyone's eyes are looking at you and people now have expectations. And I think it's okay, you did this, now what's next and what's Mm. next versus I think, you know, in that bubble of living in a Midwestern city, not really having that kind of exposure, no one really thought much, you know, of like, this girl's just gonna become a doctor. (laughs) I love that because I I often talk about this. I would identify myself as a confident person and I think you would too as well, right? Yeah, I would. We're both very confident. Does that mean I'm confident in every era of my life with every action that I do? No. So why don't we apply the same logic for when we fail? Why don't we apply the same logic with an inner critic? So many people will say, I'm just not confident because I wasn't confident the last time. Yeah. But think about all the times you have been. Think about all the times where you perhaps aren't even aware that you were, where you've asked a question, where you've done something where you've fallen over, where you got up on a bike again and kept riding, where you went to the park when you were afraid of swings. We can all find evidence in our lives to prove that we're confident because in order to exist, 
And in order to grow, you do have to be you in some element. You have to pull yourself back up. And yeah. I think that's where, in those times, <clears throat> even now, when you're feeling low, it's like remembering Shani, like 18-year-old version or 20-year-old yes. version had this like unbridled like optimism and just like mm-hmm. belief that it's going to work out. And you have to like find that again within you. Otherwise, like no one else is going to give it to you. You're going to make me cry for this podcast <laughs> many times. I already feel like I'm like, oh my God. So you come back from Mumbai. Yeah. Right? You go to college. You then know you 100% do not want to go down this conformative route. It's not that I knew for a fact. I think also it was ingrained in me. Like financial stability and security has always been the goal, right? And we grew up never knowing that you could make money in a creative industry. 100%. I'm not going to glamorize like, oh, like the moment you graduate, you're making six figures in a creative industry. You're not. That was a very scary and real concern for me of like when I graduate, I'm going to have peers that are going into medicine, going into investment banking, finance, consulting. How am I going to justify taking this risk if there's not the money to like back it up? So I think my mindset was in these four years of undergrad where people aren't necessarily looking at you super with that magnifying lens of like what is Shivani doing this summer Mm. I was like I better maximize these four years so throughout like all four years of undergrad like I would be interning throughout internships sorry interning throughout making those cold calls reaching out to people on LinkedIn Instagram like this full are you familiar with like the word jogard like uh, no okay so there's this Hindi word called jogard which is kind of like this ratchet way of figuring everything out no matter like the means of doing it it's not necessarily by the book you kind of just scheme the system a little bit but you get you know the job done and I think for me that was the attitude of like if I want to work in the entertainment industry I watch Bollywood movies you go to the end credits you pause the screen you write all the names down of like who are assistant directors who are people in the production team and no one's reaching out to those people right like we know yes. the big names like the Karan Johar and Karina Kapoor and Alia Bhatt but if I can get in touch with these people on the marketing teams for these Bollywood movies and reach out to them and be like I love the work you did would love to intern for you would love to talk to you there's a higher chance that they're gonna respond to me than like me just saying I'm gonna DM this actor and being like <laughs> Why aren't they like, you know, acknowledging, you know, 19 year old Shivani? And did you do uh, that? Yeah, 100%. Like, till date, I send so many cold emails and DMs to like brand managers now of like campaigns or on LinkedIn or using yeah. Rocket Reach. And it's a, ma- it's a numbers game, right? Like, you're going to send 100 DMs, you'll probably hear back from two, but those two can open up like so many more conversations. So I feel like in the bubble of undergrad, I really made the most of just like building and starting my network because you've got to really, like, I don't come from like any sort of family or background that has a connection or an end to this industry, right? Yeah. So there's no one that was gonna, like my dad's a doctor. If I went down the medical medical route, he could have probably made like 20 phone calls for me to like set up that like, you know, cancer research, like internship. But in this field, their biggest concern was like, how are you going to do this, you Mm. know? Um, And that's kind of what the mentality was like. Give me an example of when you, when one of those emails paid off in that undergrad year. Oh my God, my um, next year internship. So I interned at this company called The Asian Variety Show. They are based in the US. That was like my full-time job actually. So Okay, actually, let me, let me, how that happened. Okay, so I had this internship with the Asian Variety Show, and there were, it was a small team based in Jersey. I sent a Facebook message to the founder's friend who ran a PR company. His name is Jitin. If he watches this, he'll be like, what a freak. Um, because I, I exhausted all my options, like trying to reach out to the team of AVS. Like they weren't responding. And I, on Facebook, I was like, oh, this guy looks like he's like good friends with Raju, who's the founder of AVS. So I Facebook message Jitin and I email him saying, hi, can I intern for your PR company? I just came from Ismailani. I can like help you with this film festival. So he's like, sure, like you can come in. It was like a week long gig. I'm from Ohio, coming to New York for like, this is my freshman year summer. 
My parents are like, okay, you figured out like a 10 day internship for this film festival. What about the rest of the summer? I was like, just let me go to New York. Give me these 10 days. I will like figure out, you know, the rest of the summer. So I go in, do the 10 days with Jutsun, of course, like do the job properly. Raju, the founder of AVS, of course, like comes to this film festival and I'm like, hi i'm shivani you know fully well knowing like who he was jitin then made the intro to raju to be like yeah this girl's vetted like you can take her for an internship and that's kind of how i got my next year internship where then um i was able to interview bollywood celebrities for avs that was my next gig but that's where it's like if i hadn't sent that facebook message or if i hadn't sent that you know email one wouldn't have led to the other oh my gosh but i was like a full like i was like there's nothing to i would call people up shivani like on twitter i would like reach out to people um and i've learned there's obviously an art to doing it professionally where you don't come across like a crazy fangirl right but i do think in like a sophisticated way when you add value to someone's life where you're like hey listen i have the skill set from this internship let me apply for this or, oh, I now, you know, have this experience and I can help you with this. I think it's more likely that someone's going to respond to you rather than just being like, hi, like, can I be your intern? <laughs> can like, I spend the day with yeah, you? Yeah, can I spend the day with you? You, you know, a hundred percent. And my next question was going to be, what do you think that that message should look like in terms of you're in the, you're in the op- opposite seat now. I'm yeah. sure you must get a lot of messages where people want to spend the day with you or learn from you or work for yeah. you. What would you say a good message to a brand or to a company looks like? I think one, I made the big mistake of writing like five paragraph essays, like sharing your entire story being like, this is my whole life story. And like, no one has the time to read. I think a really crisp, concise paragraph of who you are, what value can you provide? And I recognize like at 19 or 20, you're like, what what can I do for this person? But really studying the person that you're asking and being like, maybe on Canva, you can redesign their logo. Maybe you have a skill of editing and you're like, hey, listen, I'd love to follow you around the day and I can create this beautiful 30 second editing clip for you. Right. I need people, like I would love it if someone would like do an analysis and be like this, you know, on your insights, this could be improved or I'm seeing these trends. Like, really be thoughtful about the person you're reaching out to and craft a message where it's in the it's in the position of like giving and giving and giving and only then do I feel like will you get and I think that's been one of the biggest um learnings I feel like in my professional life of there have been relationships where I feel like I've given for years on years on years and then mustered up the courage to be like can you introduce me to this person? Yes. But like going into someone's DMs and being like, I know you're connected to this person. Like, can you introduce me? They're just not going to respond. And it's just not very nice to like use someone without investing in that relationship. So I really think about playing the long game Mm. and thinking how are you going to best like set yourself up for like longevity? Yeah, 100%. I think that's such a powerful lesson. And also one thing I, I learned was this sniper approach. So many of us, when we're reaching out to people, we'll just send a blanket email to so many of these brands and companies and people. And you can tell 100% when that happens. Yeah. The sniper approach is spending five minutes of your time being very specific about the company. What's their purpose? How do you align with them? Or really understanding the pain point of that person and how you can really offer that value. And it completely changes the message. And it takes five minutes extra but it impacts you in that person in such a different way. And so I always look at now things as like a sniper approach. Don't just copy and paste the same message to 500 people. It's just never going to work. Send it to 100 people and spend those five extra minutes researching each one and find one thing that you can add value in. 100%. And also it's like not to take it personally when people don't respond. Like I have been in the shoes where you're writing these emails and you're so demotivated. Like why isn't this person getting... I just actually shared this reel where there was someone I reached out to in 2020 being like, you know, I'd love to like work together. 
no response. 2024, coincidentally, I get this email. I don't even realize it's from the same person. And we're working together now. Yes. But it's like when the timing is right and when you have put in the work in yourself, like I think so often we're focused on like, she's going to elevate my career. Like if I, once I meet her, I'm like set. But the reality is like you have to like do the work and build your own profile and work on yourself before – like these collaborations and these random people are just gonna like put magic dust on your career like that just doesn't happen it's so true i mean this happens a lot to me i'm sure it happens to you and people are like can you repost this because it's really going to help me yeah and i'm like you're asking me to repost something in the wedding industry which i have zero interest in yeah and you want me to post this random thing and you think it's going to get you followers or likes it's no. absolutely not it doesn't align yeah. and i think we just think like oh if one person reposts me one person shares it it's going to blow up and that's it's really not the case in so many scenarios but one piece of content can really change your life and that happened to you, didn't it? It did. <laughs> Tell me the story. Um, okay, so after college, yeah. I ended up moving to India with the full-time job with ABS. And I was interviewing Bollywood celebrities. And during that time, I was like, I don't know a single other second-generation Indian-American that has moved to India like by herself and wants to work in the entertainment industry. So I'm going to vlog... What is it like setting up an apartment in Mumbai? What is it like interviewing these celebrities? What is it like, you know, navigating the Bollywood industry or modeling or voiceovers? Like I have done every job under the sun within like the creative landscape and the freelance world. And I was like, I'm just going to vlog it one because I love capturing memories. I'm such a like memory hoarder. And I love looking back five years ago and being like, what was, you know, 23 year old 23 year old Shivani thinking and I started creating this content online how old were you I moved when I was 22 so for two two years I was in India and I was vlogging and sharing content and that's really when my like content creation journey started and at that time I didn't want to become an influencer I just knew that social media was going to be relevant no matter what path in this creative world I took. And I knew the value of like a personal brand. And three, I just, I'm an oversharer. I love sharing things. I love documenting things. So really it was like for myself and for my friends and family to like stay in touch and keep in touch with my life. Now I'm now moving back to the US. This is like, I'm done and dusted now with India. I'm like, okay, I'm ready to kind of start the next chapter. Right. And what we're thinking back to of the doing. US. <clears throat> I was working on a completely different startup idea. Um, it was in a, it was like in the diamond jewelry rental space. Right. Okay. Um, but the idea was kind of like, I knew I wanted to move back to the US because of like friends and family mm. and Sham, of course. And I think I had this realization that if I, live in India for the rest of my life I will see my parents once or twice a year and when I can identify that as like the happiest moments of my life I want to design a career in which like I can see my loved ones more often so I'm moving back to the U.S. now and um, in that transit Sean proposes to me in Paris and it's this very like over the top Bollywood-esque proposal, fully like surprised. I had no idea this was happening. He's been like planning it for like over six months. And that video was posted in, I think February or March of 2020, like right as COVID was starting. And it was like a 28 minute video. So at the time, like there was a thought, I was like, you know, maybe we should like cut this down. Like who's gonna watch like a 28 minute video? But at the same time, I was like, so many friends and family participated in this video and everyone wanted to see like, what is like, what what actually happened? So we're like, you know what? This is like not for the views. I'm gonna just post the entire thing and we're gonna send the link out to like friends and family. This is on YouTube. This is on YouTube. I wasn't as active on YouTube, but it posted on YouTube. And that video ended up going viral. Also, I think COVID in terms of a setting Everyone clearly had a lot of time on their hands and was sitting around watching a 28 minute video. But it was truly like, it was such a special moment and video. And that went viral. And because of that, my social media also like started growing very quickly where in July, I went from like 35,000 followers to like three months later, I got to 100,000 followers 
solely probably because of like this on proposal Instagram. video on Instagram going viral. And I mentioned this because a lot of people will look at that video and it's so easy to now look at me and be like, oh, like she only has followers because of this proposal video. But I stand by the fact that a lot of people have like viral, you know, moments or videos. But if I didn't have two and a half years before that of creating content, talking into like a phone, editing, working with brands, like, and that experience, there was no way I would have run with that moment and then really dived deep into content creation. Oh my God. I resonate with literally every word that you've said because I have a similar story. I also, can I just ask, how many followers did you have on YouTube? YouTube I don't I don't remember before the video maybe like 50,000 oh you had 50k on 40, YouTube I, I don't remember and the ha- what were the numbers on the video that went viral the video now I think has 11 mi- million fo- 11 million views 12 what? million something like that yeah it was crazy you should watch it you should watch it if you've not watched it I probably should have watched it before this <laughs> 11 million yeah Sham deserves Sham deserves a lot of claps. I hope you're giving him the YouTube money from that. Yeah, no, it can't be monetized. It has volume and music all throughout. And I didn't earn a single penny from that video. No, <laughs> no. I mean, it wasn't really Just posted, mute it but... now. Just yeah, mute it, it now. Yeah, it kills the impact, Chavad. You need the feels. <laughs> okay, I'm going to watch it straight after this. It's so interesting because I, 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 like I said, I have a very similar story where I was doing the podcast for two and a half years. I then upload this video on Instagram, I remember it so clearly on Friday, and I said, do not ask me when I'm getting married. And then some random person on TikTok takes the video, and she uploads it on TikTok. And I remember on Sunday morning, looking at my TikTok, thinking, did I upload this video? And I was like, oh, I did it. And I was like, why are people, why is, I don't get it, why is it on TikTok? At the time, this time I didn't even know how to use it. And I'm like, oh, this random person has uploaded it. It's got a million views in one day. How how interesting. I remember going on Instagram and saying, hey, guys, should I be upset that this person hasn't tagged me in the, in the video that they've just reposted and it's got a million views? People were like, yeah, you should be. People were like, no, you should be. And I was like, mm, don't think anything of it. In one week, I grew from 17 and a half thousand followers to 55. Yeah. Every day, I remember my mom would be coming in being like, 25, yeah. 29, 35. My friends would be messaging me and I was like, wait, what? And it it used to annoy me when people would say, oh my God, this one video made you viral. And I'm like, maybe it was the 75 podcasts I did before that and the two and a half years of work I did before that that made the video go viral because somebody will see a viral video. They'll like it. They'll then go on your profile. They'll then see if that content aligns with all the other stuff and then they choose to follow you. And to like stick around, right? Like Exactly. <clears throat> they can see that one video in isolation and it's beautiful, amazing. Yeah. But then they've had to stick around like for four years after that, you know? Actually, we're going on like five years now. Um, Crazy. But yeah, I, I'm a big believer. Like when you put in the work and I, I take that now even in like new businesses where mm. you have to put in the work and then I'm a believer that these miracles are going to happen. Like you... And then that miracle and being able to run with that miracle only happens, though, when you put in the work beforehand. It doesn't just, like, you don't just, like, start on, you know, Instagram and expect that the first video you post is going to get a million views. Like, if you have that mentality, it's it's not going to happen. You're going to be upset. (laughs) No, for sure. The the persistence is very key. Yeah. And I I, want to talk about that. So you you basically have this viral video. In three months, you start growing. Yeah. Do you then tailor your content to be around your wedding? You know, I think there was definitely thought around that. And I recognized that people really, I hadn't shown my relationship ever on social media before that. So again, come from a pretty relatively like conservative family. I never posted pictures of Sham as my boyfriend. Yes. Literally the first video with him was our proposal. Like man is in my life and has been in my life the last five Same. years. No one knew that though. Um <laughs> We were also in COVID. We're all sitting around. My family's there. There was really nothing else super exciting going on. Right. Um, so I definitely created a lot of content, you know, with Sham. He also enjoyed it. He is equally as creative. Things have definitely changed where I think now we've realized, I don't know how much of like relationship stuff, you know, mm. I want to continue to share. But at the time, we were having a lot of fun with it and that that kind that that type of content was growing um and then i think the real question for me was okay you can have followers you can have subscribers but how can you actually t- 
turn this into a business where you're able to like make money from it or how do you even get a brand deal like no one walks you through the baby steps of like how you pitch yourself or what are the rates supposed to be and what is exclusivity and what are ad rights and what like how do you navigate all of that so that was kind of like the next phase so what do you do tell us what? tell us all <laughs> where do you start give um, us a master class this is the Shwani okay Bhakna so the master class is one um value driven content is key right having content where you have a clear audience in mind right it's one right. thing to create but like are you able to integrate and the beauty of the internet now is you could promote anything in this world right but like are you creating content where you can integrate a fashion brand in a jewelry brand in lifestyle travel footwear whatever that is to really having a strong voice around the content right it's one thing for me i saw this gap where everything was super filtered and picture perfect and everyone just looked a certain way online yes yes. but how does that product integrate in like a real way where it's not just me dressing up in my apartment to like dress up but me living life and showing you those products let's say in action and then three I think it's about building an audience that so I actually didn't monetize until I hit that hundred thousand so I didn't made made a single dollar from Instagram until I hit a hundred thousand which was a, a bit Many people didn't necessarily agree with the strategy. My logic was I want to create 100,000 people who like me for me as like Shivani Bhavna, the human, not for like all these products that I'm selling down your throat. But then once I've built this loyal community, then to start monetizing after that I was just wow. kind of my, my, I don't know if that's the right thing or the wrong thing, but that's what I decided. Um, so then you build a media kit okay. with, which again, there's like hundreds of YouTube videos on like how to make a media kit. I made mine on Canva and then I use this search engine called Rocket Reach and you can look up on LinkedIn, let's say Nike brand manager. You'll get three names on LinkedIn. You take those LinkedIn profiles, feed it into like a search engine like Rocket Reach. It'll give you their emails and then you just start pitching yourself. And again, it's like about writing a nice tailored email of like, hi, Shivani, I love the work that you're doing. I can create this for you. Here's a previous video I did unsponsored for this shoe brand that re- that you know received this amount of views, this amount of likes. And give them exactly what they want to like read, right? Like give them the prompt, give them the video, give them the analytics. And I, I'm not saying every single time. I still do this. It's not, I have an, there's an agency that manages me now. It's a lot more streamlined. But even now, like, we are outwardly pitching. It's not just, like, Inbound. deals just, like, land up in your lap, you know? Wow, this is amazing. So you basically use all these different websites, right? You then started to do that at 100K. Yeah. How many no's did you get before you got a yes? Oh, at least 100. I think I sent, like, 100 a week probably like 400 500 what yeah i'm not even exaggerating because it, uh, it's like technically it's kind of like not brainless work but it's just like menial where you just have mm. to keep keep sending out emails you know yes. and like you have to just but alongside that you have to continue creating content right so it's not just like one can stop for the other but yeah it's a matter of just continuously pitching yourself going to a, again events didn't exist because we were in covid yes but um reaching out to people on instagram like i like the work you do would love to like learn from you and coming from like a good intentioned place mm. not being like a moocher type yes. of vibe yes. and i think with brands your engagement and like that loyalty that your audience has to you is key so i think cultivating a really strong community will naturally lead to paid partnerships down the line if that's like a goal how do you create a strong community i feel like it's a really overused statement but like authenticity i think is key in really humanizing your platform like i feel like when i record a story I'm updating my friends and family on like what's going on and I'm going to go meet Shivani and we're going to record this podcast. And I'm feeling there like I feel like I'm recording like diary entries and I think right. 
it's so easy to get bored of following someone that only does one thing over and over and over again but when you fall in love with like a human even if we're not the exact same like you could be living in a fully different part of the country having a completely different career but I'm just like oh I like her life and it's just like fun to follow along this journey of like this girl and her adventures and if I had to really microscopically look out and be like why would someone follow me I think it's because they enjoy the human aspect of Mm. following me through my life you talk a lot about you know seeing a certain type of creator online seeing a certain type of person online we're inundated with so many creators at the moment I think and I think that's a good thing actually because we all can bring a unique thing but we all can also very easily conform how did you not? Because you are very different. You think? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I I really do. I don't... Look, I think anyone who hasn't got plastic surgery, anyone who hasn't dyed their hair, anyone who doesn't fall into the traps... Because I think this all the time. Like, the other day I took a photo, I put it on Instagram, and I was like, my wrinkles! I was like, shit! And I was like, to no. Nico, I was like, oh my God, look at these. He was like, you've always had that. I was like, oh my God, now you're making me feel worse. And I was like, and then, so, and then I was talking to someone on this podcast, and then I just get Botox. And I was like, no, I'm not gonna get flipping Botox. Like, everyone has it. And it's mm. so, that's just one example, by the way. I'm talking about, like, looks as one example of, like, not conforming. But there's so many other elements of like the types of pictures you take, the way you pose, um, the way in which you you tell a story or like the caption. And sometimes it's really hard to not want to take a picture in that kind of like model-esque New York way. Like when I'm here, I'm like, I want to take it with like the coffee cup in my head looking down and like my outfit. Yellow taxi in the background. You know, (laughs) it's it's hard. It's hard sometimes to constantly innovate, but also you want to fit in. You want to be, you want to fit into something. And I think yeah. the influence culture is a whole another culture. So how did I you think, stop doing that? I think for me, Shani, I have felt so validated offline, like off mm. of Instagram. And I have such a strong, like offline support system in my parents, my in-laws, my partner, my brother, my close like college friends that I've never really, and this sounds like such a, it is such a privileged thing to say, but I've never felt like I don't necessarily fit in online because that was never really the goal. Like I know that there are like real life human beings who love me for who I am. So who gives a shit? Like what random people think? Like someone could look at me like, why is she posting this? Like who cares? But I'm like, I know my group of like 10 people care. So like that's all that matters, you know? And so I think it really reduces that pressure you put on your head like when I hit post I don't think about that number of like this many eyeballs are seeing my story or this many and of course like we're human and it gets to you yeah but the majority of the time I'm like what is that group of 10 people what are they gonna think are they gonna think it's funny are they gonna get my intention are they gonna be like oh yeah that's what Shivani's up to today and it reduces the pressure of trying to like fit into this super aesthetic yes this like extreme make oh i mean people should do whatever makes them happy for sure i feel like for me it's like when someone meets me in real life who's a follower and if i'm like in my pajamas without makeup looking however i don't even necessarily feel as stressed because they've seen that version of me online they're like yeah we know shivani's probably like <laughs> not got her life fully together so it's fine and i so think true. it reduces the stakes versus if you create this narrative online where everything is perfect and put together and you always have a full face of makeup and you're always super stylish or like wearing heels then there's probably an expectation offline where you feel like I have to constantly like hundred percent you know keep it up but if I come in sneakers that are like kind of dirty like they're gonna be like it's fine (laughs) my two of us hey everyone I am so sorry to interrupt the episode I'm in Bodrum for a retreat which is very fun and I'll tell you about that another time but I have tried very very hard to salvage my audio from this podcast and unfortunately what you're gonna hear in the next 20 minutes of this episode is the best that we could do so if you look very closely When Shivani is telling me that her shoes are dirty, I show her my shoes and I obviously disconnect the wire, which is so annoying. So, so annoying because the audio is not great after that. So Shivani's audio is totally fine, but my audio for the next 25 minutes 
isn't great, but I hope that it's okay enough for you to understand the questions that I'm asking. But don't worry, because Shivani's audio is great, so you'll be able to hear her until the end of the podcast. But I just wanted to warn you that I'm really sorry that sometimes these things happen unexpectedly, but I hope you still enjoy the rest of the episode and you let me know how you found it. But I think I, I, I completely agree with you and I, I get sometimes so, um, I find it so freeing, you know? Yeah. Like I, you know, you see like paparazzi pictures of like people who like their outfits are so mismatched and jammed. I do this every day and I always have this idea when I live in like the city in London that I was going to be this aesthetic girl. You know, yeah. I always wanted to, I, I, truly, honestly, I pray for the day that I, one, am able to pose like that, two, able to dress like that and three, yeah. have a stylist so I don't have to think about what to wear. But every day when I leave my flat to get a coffee, I look like I'm homeless in the sense that like I'm wearing a red beanie and I'm wearing my brown teddy coat, which is a hole in its pocket. And I'm wearing my black Uggs and I'm wearing my, my gray trousers. And I'm like, but this is actually me. Like this yeah. is this is who I am. And when I see people, so like the other day I was walking and I had like toothpaste on my face and someone was like, you have one. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> my God. You know, but you know, we can't show everything online. Like I'm no. not gonna, I, I didn't even know I had toothpaste on my face because I hadn't put a camera in my face that day. Do you share bad moments online? Like when things are very bad? touch wood i don't feel like there's anything so far in my life where i'm like this is terrible and like i can't share it online i mean i think it's important for me to be able to process things first offline and be fully present in that moment but i do think it's important to like take your audience through these moments where like recently there have been so many ups and downs and like starting corefeld or starting like different projects where it creates a level of empathy i think when you're able to share like this was really hard but at the same time i think we have to put things in perspective especially within the influencer culture where it's like everyone works hard and like everyone is going through things so me being like i'm so upset my day's ruined that like my flight got delayed it's like shavati like look in the mirror like life is good you know and i think there's many times where it's healthier for me to like internalize it offline or not internalize it but talk about it offline or like vent to it with my mom or my girlfriends Mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to make it to an instagram story because it's like we have perspective in life. Um, But I think some of the big things, it is important to let people in that this is what's happening or you're bothered by this and finding that healthy balance. I think five years ago, I probably spilled way more on the internet, like real time where it's like, I'm so upset that this happened to me. And now it's kind of realizing. Mm let it you know let it pass process it don't react directly to the emotion um and then kind of respond i want to go back to the monetization question because one thing i find really difficult okay from my perspective is people don't like ads they like they just really don't enjoy them okay and that's fair enough no one wants to be sold something fake and I would understand if I was someone who posted like an ad every day. I think I post like one ad a month every six weeks, if that. Yeah. And people are like, I hate it when you do ads. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you want me to pay for this studio? <laughs> how do you want me to pay for this podcast? How do you want me to share this information with you? Because no. I also have to find a way to make your business work. You know, like I also need to eat. I also need to live. So how do you want me to do it? And I think there's an expectation that we should be constantly sharing free content online and we shouldn't be doing any paid work. So how did you overcome that? It's tough because I definitely think your engagement like tanks when you see ad after ad. But I think it's realizing when you again explain it to your community that this is like a necessary part, like for me to create fun content or me to like, you have to do paid work and there's no way around that. And I assure you that 80 90% of creators are aligning with brands that they believe in, that they use, that they test. It's not just like this money grab of who, like I say no all the time to the point where sometimes a manager is like, Shani, you need to like, you know, say yes to certain things. But um, it is a healthy balance. And I think it's kind of, I've learned so much around like paid content where certain things, 
in the beginning, 100% I've signed, said yes for the money. But at the time, it's like, you can't be so choosy. Like, if you don't say, like, who is paying my rent? Like, if I don't say it. Um, and I look back at certain campaigns and I'm like, oh, God, Shani, why did you, like, why did you say yes to this? But uh, people's attention spans are also fleeting and people probably don't remember two years ago some of the things that I did that are like, Shivani, this was terrible. I think the way in which you create content is very, very unique. I mean, I remember seeing the Z ad for, I can't remember what movie it was, something too. What was it? It was like with Sean when you were crying. He was crying. Oh, oh, God, there too. Oh, yeah. That was just, the creativity was amazing. Do you have a template you can show on how you actually create content? No, the template, Shivani, is me looking and being like, Sham, if you need to participate in this, what should we do? What should we create? Like, if he's involved, then of course, like he has to give his two cents. Um, but honestly, most of the time, I like keeping it as organic as possible or trying to like find a play on words or like if it's a Indian outfit, like actually going to a wedding event where you can showcase it or if it's a food item, like you're, it's believable that you're making it and it's not like this full production of like, I put on a full face of makeup to like show you this thing. Um, but no, sadly, there is no like brilliant formula and it's a lot of trial and failure and then kind of figuring out what format works, um, length that works for brands, um, how often are you using it and can you integrate it kind of organically beforehand so it doesn't just seem like out of the blue she's sharing this product mm -hmm. but it's a learning curve for me too i don't think i've like cracked it by any means when you were doing all this con you're doing all of this content creation right are you making good money from it would you say at this point a couple of years ago i would say so why did you then decide to start a brand why did i decide to start a brand so i think a lot of influencers in the moment right like the money is good and there's no denying that but we don't necessarily think about the future right and what are like four steps ahead and while i was doing tv show hosting right the money was coming from tv show hosting and content was this thing on the side that was running and all of a sudden the content income like supersedes the tv show hosting income and then you pivot your career and you're like okay now i'm gonna do content i think the same thing my prediction is I don't know how long this influencer bubble is going to last, right? Like, what is relevancy going to look like in 10 years? What are my own emotions going to be like in 10 years? Will people care what I have to say in 10 years? I don't know. That's one thing. I think the second genuine thing is after a certain point, like your mental stimulation of feeling like a challenge or like learning something new yes. or exciting or creating something that's bigger than like me, the majority of my content is, it is very narcissistic. Like that's influencer culture in general is like, hi, it's me, Shivani, follow me, like me. Like it is all about me, but that's not necessarily as fulfilling to create something that's bigger than just Shivani. Um, and that was kind of the intention behind starting a brand was one, diversifying income and thinking about the future because who knows how long this is going to last and two, creating something that's bigger than just like my face. <laughs> Talk to me about Corfelt. Why the name? Why the, the name Corfelt? Um, well, it's a whole story because that was not meant to be the name. And then I realized I should have gotten a trademark lawyer way earlier in the game. Um, I had a whole different name and then I realized and everything was printed and done and packaging. And then I realized I can't use that name. Um, so I had like 10 days to like figure everything else out. And in this day and age to find a name where the trademark is available and the Instagram and it's like two syllables and it's a nice sounding name and the domains available. Like it is so hard to find this, but I, I feel like it all happened for a reason. It's a play on the word like heartfelt, but to really feel something in your core and something that what makes you feel alive and what kind of makes your core 
that to me is kind of the ethos behind core felt. And I think so often we think about core and like abs and fitness and like build your core. What about like your mental core, like your inner core that kind of lights you up and creating these core felt memories? I think if I look at my life, the biggest joy has come from like these core memories and core felt experiences. And I want us all to kind of focus on embracing that in the moment when it happens. Because sometimes we just like let life go by and we look at these milestones you know like 100k interviewed this person did that did this but it's like life is about these like small mundane core felt moments like with your offline people that are fleeting and that was kind of the idea behind the brand name oh my god i love that it's so deep i think what i really love about it is just so different from any other kind of brand out there right now thank you what's so good about the activewear what is so no so it, it is it's right now in the athleisure category um what we're doing matching been? sets so it's interesting you ask me this i started it because i love living in loungewear and i love being comfortable and cozy but it's a really really competitive category right because you have so many different blends and fabrics and materials and fully open to the idea of like pivoting the exact category in the future as long as it kind of aligns with our mission of feeling comfortable in the clothes that you're wearing seeing connection to the clothing hence like the qr code on our clothing where you kind of get an experience or just like feel something in like the clothes that we wear and have a story attached to the clothes you have a qr code and i remember seeing this real yeah you, you you get invited to pa- to can yeah on the red carpet and you take a handbag and you put a qr code on it why so i was invited to can and i was like what am i gonna do there on this red carpet but it was such a pinch me moment so i fly out there and i was like well i want to like share a story i want there to be some meaning behind my look like i don't want to just go on this carpet and like pose like hi i'm shivani like take my picture um and like what can i share and really be honest about that moment because to the world can looks like this ultra glamorous everyone is like living their best life and hair and makeup and gown i on the other hand internally and maybe others feel like that on the carpet i'm like scared shitless i am like so nervous how is it gonna be how am i gonna look it's so chaotic and i wanted to share that story about it's not all like you know roses and unicorns like in these moments like so many times you have so much imposter syndrome and you're like is is this even me um so I wanted to share that story via like the QR code. So it linked to a letter, which I was able to share of how I was genuinely feeling in that moment. And I felt like it was, again, an opportunity for storytelling where you could kind of demystify that moment and be real with people that it's not just like I wasn't born to be on can. Like I never would have, if you told me at like 10, like Shivani, you're gonna like walk the can. I'd be like, you're crazy, you're losing your mind. Right. Um, but it's okay to be honest about the fact that I didn't necessarily feel like I fit in in that moment. Mm, I think we all appreciate that vulnerability. Yeah. Right. We can, we can look at everyone on the red carpet and be like, you're having the best time. But there's been lots of times when I've been at events and no one is speaking to me, so I have to go and hide in the toilet. Yeah. After Cannes, I picked up a full pie of pizza. I changed into my... I was wearing pajamas, by the way, underneath my gown. Yes. Didn't go to any, like, after party. And I was like, I just want to, like, decompress and, like, enjoy that moment by myself in an Airbnb that is how I spent after like the can red carpet, right? But the versions that we see online of these events are like everyone's like partying and thriving and like the works. Um, so I don't know. It can be exhausting. And I think also you mentioned you suffer from imposter syndrome. Yeah. Everyone does. I mean, I do many times. How do you overcome that? I don't think there's like a snap where you're like oh I I figured it out but I do think it's about realizing that 
everyone's feeling like that. Like you meet super successful, talented people. And in conversation, I think you realize like there's nothing super uniquely special or gifted about like a lot of smart people, you know? And it's about building that inner confidence because if you don't, like no one else will. So a lot of it I think is faking it till you make it and just having that inner dialogue that's like no like you belong to be here and like you however you sell it in your brain you kind of deserve to be there i love how you spoke about your inner circle as well because i think having people around you like your family your in-laws your friends who actually inspire that confident side in you you know they support that confident element of you they're not like what the hell are you doing yeah you know it's, it's really amazing and they know you're a good human being you know how many people like you think that they're like on the top and they're killing it in their careers but they're just so lonely like Mm. they don't have offline people who are there in their low times and in their happy times and i think it can be such a vicious cycle to continuously be doubting yourself and being like am i worth it like should i belong here like what do i like you're constantly doubting yourself so i fully credit like the offline circle to how you kind of one build that confidence and to like show up in these places where you're like i can do this too <laughs> i love the offline element but there are times I'm, i presume that you've gone to an event or you've been somewhere where you don't have that offline person with you yeah and there's been someone who's put you down or made you feel a bit uncomfortable, or made you feel, I don't know, I felt this way, definitely excluded. All the time. All the time. Yeah. How do you deal with that in that moment? I think it's realizing that people just project their own insecurities onto other people. That goes for people online, it goes for people offline. like. Anyone who is secure in where they are in their career and in their life does not have the time of day to like waste five seconds of their energy putting someone else down or like giving off the vibe that like, I'm so much cooler than you, you know, like. Write that down, everyone. Let's write it together. I I think I, I honestly cannot resonate with that more because there's, there's always gonna be someone that's like pointing something bad that you've done or like doing, saying, making a comment about something that's happened. And I'm always like, how do you have the time? Honestly, how do you have yeah. the time? But I think that unfortunately, we perhaps don't see a side of people that we believe to be true because we could never be that way. Yeah. So I remember speaking to someone and they said that there was someone online that was spewing all this hate on this person's account. um, And they themselves were like pretending to be this like perfect mom and like housewife. I just can't understand that. So I can't believe that someone would do that, right? But how in that moment do you cope? Because I I, I completely agree with you. Like you have to in that moment be like, okay, well you're just clearly really insecure or like there's something going on here and I feel sorry for you and I have empathy towards you and I'm gonna be compassionate. But how do you deal with that over and over again? You just said all the time, it must be difficult in this in the moment to be able to rationalize that thought i think it's something that bothers me is like people will say it and i'm never able to think of like the response in that moment right and then some like three business days later i'm like i should have said this like this would have been a smarter comeback um because again i think my personality type is it's always like oh, they, they mean well, like they're just caring for you or like oh, I'm empathizing with the fact yes. they're looking out for you. Yeah. And so they're saying it from like a place of I mean well. And then when you objectively kind of look at it, you're like this person is just consistently pointing out that this could have been better. You could have done this. At events, you go sometimes places and you're like, why do I feel so like isolated you know and you're like you don't feel like you're a part of like the group Mm. but then I also remind myself like this is a job at the end of the day and we don't have to be best buds with every single person that we meet like we're not I look at Chum and like in a corporate career he's not like best friends with all of his like corporate finance buddies and sharing their deepest darkest secrets you know like they go to their job to work they go to their happy hours to network and they come home and it's kind of the same thing. And I think sometimes we 
conflate like friendship with colleagues in this industry where like you feel like because we're having such an in-depth conversation like now you owe me one to be like my best friend when it's like no this is your job like we're having this conversation excuse me <laughs> no I mean, I mean you do no I'm just joking <laughs> and sometimes these will organically turn into beautiful friendships 100% but having the expectation that every single person at that like influencer event is gonna pull you into their corner and give you a big hug is also a false expectation to have from people and it's okay right. I think it's also realizing like don't take it too personally, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way. I have conversations with people and sometimes I'm they're like my best friend. You yeah. Know, that's happened to me before. And then I have conversations with people and I don't speak to them again. And it's not that I didn't enjoy my conversation. It's not like I didn't learn from them. It's just, it's just I can't connect and be best friends with like 600 people every exactly. day. So <laughs> I think that, you know, it, it. you're so right in terms of that element and letting go of that guilt as well is very important. I think when I look at you, I think you are, first of all, like one of the kindest people I've met, but also one of the most confident. What's the best piece of advice you've received when you're not perhaps feeling so confident or you're perhaps dealing with a little insecurity or imposter syndrome? And what can you share with someone who's struggling with that today? Oh, this is a good one. Um, I hear my mom's voice just like ringing in my head of just like, pick yourself back up mm. and just do it like it will work out and my mom is like i love you mom just this beacon of mm. you have to do it for yourself no one else is going to like come in and save you and fix all your problems and if you're right. not that person for yourself I hope one day I have like a baby daughter that like looks at me also and is like, look at what mom was able to accomplish. And like, that's the way I look at my mom. Like it's, I think we just owe it to ourselves. It's not for the hundreds of thousands of followers. It's not for like the millions of people that will listen to this podcast. It's millions. There will be millions. (laughs) It's for ourselves, you know, and we owe it. Like we have one life. Life is so (laughs) fleeting. That's, like, my biggest driver, (laughs) Shivani. Like, I am so fearful of, like, death and, like, losing people. I was just telling my, um, a friend this the other day that I feel like at any point in time, like, I could receive a phone call that, you know, someone close to me has passed or something has happened and everything is going to change. So while I'm living in this, like, moment where I can just make the most of it, cry it out self-pity for that day two days however long you need but you gotta get yourself back up like no one else is gonna get you up otherwise so true true. honestly i got very emotional there when you were talking about your mom because i think the self-belief piece is so so essential and it's so amazing to hear that story of how your mom is that for you yeah and i i just love that and honestly i think you are so positive your energy is so uplifting thank you i've had the best time talking to you i can't believe this is like your first in-person podcast you are amazing (laughs) amazing you've inspired me so much i hope that she's inspired you too and i can't wait for millions of people to watch this episode too i'm manifesting that i'm manifesting it why won't it happen (laughs) thank you so much Thank you for having me. This felt like we could be talking for two more hours after this, which I hope happens after this podcast. I don't know. You can't have any expectations of me, Shivani. You're just my colleague. We're grabbing coffee after this, guys. Don't worry. Let's go. (laughs) 